That was a, thank you. That was an awesome song to hear you guys sing. I've never heard that song, that Nothing Else song. Um, some of you sponsors out there may remember the song Heart of Worship. I'm coming back to the Heart of Worship and it's all about you. That's what it made me think of. It was like this generation of the version of that song. It was awesome. It was cool to hear that. Um, okay, so I don't know how it is with you guys and where you're from, but in Stillwater, lately, as I'm working with my high school students, a lot of them, it's just kind of a no-brainer, a given, um, expected that they're going to get a car to drive when they turn 16. Um, and whenever I was growing up, it wasn't quite as expected as it seems like it is now. Um, we had, I had a lot of friends that did get cars, some nicer than others, but for me, I never, ever expected that I would have one. My dad was my youth minister, my mom did odd jobs to make money, and it was just not, we never even talked about it or pretended like it was going to actually happen. I have an older brother, a younger brother, and my older brother obviously turned 16 first, and what happened when he turned 16 is that my grandpa, my dad's dad, actually gave us a car. And he gave us a car, and Titus got to drive it, and he was driving it for like a year and a half, right, before it was my turn to be 16. And so I was just excited that I was going to be able to share a car with my brother. And we were pretty excited. He was not so excited. I was just excited that I wasn't going to just be sharing with my mom and dad. I could fight with my brother about when I got to borrow the car, you know what I mean? But I couldn't. My parents could just trump me, right, anytime I wanted it. So I was excited about this idea. Little did I know. Little did I know that there was this other guy, there's this man in the church that my dad had had come through his ministry a long time ago, and um, he wanted to do something for our family, and what he did is he worked a lot on cars. And so he bought this old clunker that's a, I think, 1988 Geo Prism. It was white. It's, it's junky, okay? And he fixed it up. Not like making it look awesome on the outside, but he fixed it up so it worked really well, and he surprised us by giving me this car when I turned 16, so I had my own car. And so I have a picture of actually when he did this. There we are in the garage. That's me and my older brother freaking out because we walk into the garage and this car's there, and so Titus is happy he doesn't have to share a car. I'm pumped I have a car, and Daryl is the one that gave it to us, and he's just like, okay, this is really weird, right? Um, so there we are. We are really, really excited. I mean, you have freedom. You got your little bit of a piece of property that is yours. I can use it how I want, when I want. I can go wherever I want. Um, I call my friends. I can't believe this. I have my own car. It's awesome. And so I was really excited because it was mine. I didn't care if it looked nice. It got me from point A to point B. It had air, it had air in it. It had a way for me. And that day, we used like CD players. I put my discs in there, got them all lined up. I got to go get stuff to deck it out inside. I wanted to hang something from the rearview mirror, all that kind of stuff, make it smell real good. You know what I'm saying? And so I was just excited because it was mine. Or at least I thought it was. But before I actually ever got to start driving it as my car, my parents sat down with me and had a conversation. And I remember vaguely them having this conversation with Titus, but it was kind of a wake-up call for me. They sat me down and they said, Morgan, we just want to make something very clear to you before you get too excited. Yes, you can be excited that you have a car. Yes, this is awesome. Yes, this is something to be um, overjoyed about. But never forget that this is actually not your car. You see, when Daryl came up to us and said he wanted to give us a car, we said, that's only okay with us if, you get, if you're giving it to us, not like giving it to Morgan. And the reason was this. They said, Morgan, you are in this family, you follow our rules, and this is our car that we are letting you borrow. Let's just be clear. It is our car that we are letting you use. That means that if you do something we tell you not to do, this car can be gone. We can take it away. You need to care for it and maintain it, but we're the ones paying the insurance. It is our car that we are letting you borrow. Now, in the heat, it really, to be honest, it wasn't like, oh man, I'm so disappointed. I was so excited I had a car, I really didn't care, but um, thinking back on it as I've gotten older, I realized my parents kind of had to do that a lot with me growing up kind of remind me my place in the family. 
In fact, I remember like going to the dinner table and our rule was my mom put three side dishes out and you had to eat the main dish you were given and you had to pick two out of the three side dishes and eat those. And you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. This was like the refrain. You eat what's on the table. If you don't finish it, you don't get dessert. And not only that, you don't get to get up and leave the table. So you can sit there all night if you want to, but you're going to eat what I fix for you. I'm not some person that you can order food from that just slaves away in the kitchen all day. My mom was very clear about that. You are not the boss, Morgan. And my brothers, I was sandwiched between them, year and a half on, my older brother's a year and a half older than me, younger brother's a year and a half younger than me, and um, they, I would kind of, you know, I was kind of known, Titus was the provoker, Austin was the one that always got provoked, um, and also followed us and everybody did, and I was the bossy one. And the refrain I would hear over and over and over from my brothers is this, you are not my mom, you are not my mom, or, or another way to say this would be, you are are not the boss. <laughs> You're not the boss. Now, my parents were very clearly, when I was growing up, the ones in charge of my family. And I was blessed to have parents who followed the Lord, so God was very much the one in charge of them as they were in charge of our family. But one thing was made clear to me. I was not the boss. And I want to say something to start out this message today because I think it's something you need to know as kind of what Caleb was saying. This is it. You're going home. We're challenging you to do some things. We're challenging you to continue to grow in your relationship with Jesus. We're challenging you to be used by him to reach a lost world. We're challenging you to make a move. But you need to keep this in mind. So I'm just going to say it right out. <clears throat> God invites us to join in his story. It's marvelous and wonderful and it is always to be continued. But it is not the other way around. God, in, God invites us to join into his story. You're not inviting God to join into your story. That is a very important distinction to make when you decide to be a follower of Jesus. It means that you are not the boss. That's what it means. It means that you make a decision to follow the Lord, but you're not in control of how all of that plays out, how that may go. When you give your life to Jesus, you're saying you submit your life to following Jesus. You recognize that you are not the boss. You are committed to him. And yes, he graciously gives us the opportunities to like have freedom in the ways that we follow him. And he gives us gifts and passions that we can use to glorify him in creative ways. But he is definitely the one in charge. He's definitely the one that is, that is going to make it happen for us. Proverbs 19, 16, 9 says it this way. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Unknowingly to me, God was using my parents to prepare me for that fact for the rest of my life as I continued to follow Jesus on my own, outside of my family context. I gave my life to Jesus when I was nine, like officially, publicly confessed him, was baptized um, into him, and, and have been following him since. And then when I was 14, I got to go on this mission trip to inner city Dallas. And I got to work with a whole bunch of kids from the inner city area there. And when I left there, I knew something had been ignited in me. That I wanted to do something with kids from hard places. And I just knew this is something that um, God was orchestrating in my life. And so I was 14, so this is kind of how I imagined it would play out. I thought, I will go to college, I will marry someone who does ministry, we will go work in an inner city area together, I will adopt a whole bunch of children, I might even start a nonprofit. it's going to be this glorious thing, and I am going to just be able to work with all these kids from hard places, that's how it's going to work. And then, that didn't happen. I went to Bible college. And I did not meet someone to spend the rest of my life with. I did not get married. And I graduated college, and I thought, what in the world am I supposed to do? 
oh Lord, this wasn't the plan. And he had to remind me that I'm not the boss. I'm either with him as a part of his story or I'm not. So he called me to go to New Orleans. I went and worked there for about six months. It was extremely hard. I came back and I thought, I don't know what to do with my life. This is crazyville. What am I, what am I supposed to do? And my parents said, hey, there's this church in Owasso, Oklahoma. You should go. Um, they're looking for a children's minister. And they've reached out to us and they'd like you to come kind of apply for this. And I said, ah, I don't want to do children's ministry. That is not what I want to do. And it's Owasso, Oklahoma. And I don't know if you know this, but Owasso is like the furthest thing from an inner city environment that I've ever been in. It's like the suburbs. It's ridiculous. Okay? I didn't want to go, but I did. Because it's not my story. It's the Lord's. And when I was there, God actually allowed me to start volunteering at an emergency shelter in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I found out that there was one about 20 minutes from where I lived, and I called a church in Tulsa that went to visit, and I asked them if I could go with them. And they said, sure. So I went, and then I figured out how to become a volunteer myself. And this emergency shelter, what it does is kids that end up being removed from their families and put into the foster care system, if there is no foster home to take them, and there is no respite provider to take them, and there is no um, shelter or group home to take them, they go to this emergency shelter. And it's supposed to be very temporary. You're only supposed to be there for like one to three days. But um, lots of kids ended up being there for months at a time. And I started volunteering there in all of my spare time. There were about 81 kids there whenever I was volunteering. And they thought I worked there because I spent so much of my time there. I mean, I was single. I had this freedom too. And so I would work, in, I would work during the day and then I would leave. And I'd go there until about 11 p.m. Until they were all asleep. And then I'd go home. And on my day off on Fridays and Saturdays, I'd be there all day. I loved it. And after a while, when I was there, I kept feeling like the Lord wanted me to foster. And I thought, this is weird. It's not like in the normal context I thought it was going to be where I'm married and we're doing this. How does this work? I don't know about this. And then a little boy came to the shelter and his name was Quan. And he came with two brothers, and his brothers got placed pretty quickly, but Quan was hard to place. And um, I actually, that's literally what they told me. I, I went and I said, how come he's not placed? And they said, well, here are some of the issues he has. And so he has this label called hard to place. And actually what that means is if he ends up becoming someone that can be up for adoption, like if his parents' rights are ever terminated, then he'll probably have that label stick with him, and it will translate to unadoptable. And that did not sit well with me. And the more I volunteered, this 11-year-old boy and I just kept crossing paths over and over and over and over again. And eventually what I did is I took foster classes. I prayed to God and said, "Um, please tell me what you want me to do here because I'm feeling a little bit nervy. I'm 24 years old, living in Owasso, and you keep putting this 11-year-old boy like with me all the time. And I felt a very clear call to bring that boy home with me, and so I did. So I did. Not my plan. That was not my plan. Now hear me. I knew in part that God had given me a heart for kids from hard places. Okay? I, had been incre- I knew that I had been incredibly blessed to have an entire family who loves Jesus deeply. And that that love ought to be shared and poured out into others, adding to our family, specifically through adoption. I felt like that for a long time. I had started babysitting in high school, and it turned out that a lot of the kids I babysat, they were adopted. I have grandparents who were fostering special needs kids all the way growing up, so seeing uh, faces come in and out of our home, that was pretty normal at holidays and family gatherings. God was definitely doing something in my life in this direction, but... Uh, The story um, that I had planned was just different. It involved a husband, and it involved little children, and it involved a whole bunch of them, and and it didn't involve just like me and an 11-year-old boy in my car on the way back to my apartment. But I found myself, six and a half years ago now, I found myself driving home from the emergency shelter with this 11-year-old boy. (laughs) And I was just telling God, I remember starting to freak out. And I just remember telling God over and over, Lord, I trust what you're doing. 
Help me to trust what you're doing because I am really afraid. But this is God's story, not mine. It's God's story, not mine. And there was no doubt in my mind that he had led me to the emergency shelter, that he had intertwined my life with Quan's, and that he wanted this child to come home with me, even if just for a short time. So I joined in what God was already doing. I linked my story to his. You know, God has always had a plan, by the way. You guys know that, right? You've been kind of looking at it this week. You've been hearing about Elijah, but let me just kind of remind you, because it's been a long time since you guys first got here a few days ago. A lot of things have happened in between. We find ourselves in Scripture in the middle of a time where God's people have been split into two kingdoms. There's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And we have all these evil kings running in the north. They're running things. And God sends prophets to speak to his people, specifically calling them to be faithful to the one true God instead of bowing down to worship idols, to worship false gods, particularly Baal. Okay? Elijah comes as a prophet to the north. And he's faithful to God, though not perfectly, and God uses him to speak to his people to work towards accomplishing his plan. And we see that there's this like huge swath of prophets of Baal, this, these false prophets that are slaughtered on Mount Carmel. Remember this? That's what happens. And God is just doing incredible things. But the problem is, after um, all, these, all these prophets of Baal are slaughtered, there's this evil queen Jezebel, Okay, the wife of the king Ahab, who's an evil king, and she worships Baal, and these are her prophets, and she is really angry at Elijah for what has happened to these prophets, and she swears, I'm going to take your head like you took the head of these prophets. And Elijah runs, kind of like a scaredy cat, away. And he finds himself in this cave on Mount Horeb. Yes, does this sound familiar? You should have been hearing about this one last night, okay? And he finds himself in this cave, and then God shows up, and he speaks to him. He speaks to him. And I think it's kind of interesting what Elijah says, <laughs> because God says this to Elijah. What are you doing here, Elijah? And then Elijah basically complains. He basically says, I've been really jealous for you. I have, I have worked hard for you. I have not failed. I've been, I've been faithful. And now I'm the only one left. <laughs> and they've all been, all these other prophets of you, they've been killed. And I'm going to die too. And I'm scared. And I don't know what to do. Why are you leaving me here? Why is this happening? It's kind of ridiculous. And then God responds to Elijah, and I think it's really funny. He doesn't really, like, address what Elijah complained about at all, except a very little piece at the end. This is what he says. After he does all this, um, the, Lord, the Lord says to Elijah, this is his response, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be the king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Mahola, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death, and the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Elijah tells the Lord that he is freaking out, and the Lord basically says, I have a plan. I have a plan. So just go. Trust me. Follow it. Do as I say. Obey. Obey. And the Lord does have a plan, remember? It's his story. And actually, based off of the end of verse 18, he also reminds Elijah at the end that he's actually not the only follower of Yahweh left. There's actually 7,000 more somewhere. Elijah complains, and the Lord gives Elijah instructions to forward his story. The Lord has spoken. And what's, what was really cool that we're looking at tonight is that Elijah obeys. He obeys. And he is used by God in doing so. He leaves, 
and finds Elisha. Listen to the text. 1 Kings 19, verse 19. We'll start there. So he departed from there, okay, leaves the cave, and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him. And he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. So he departed. Elijah departed. He left. He went. If you have your Bible with you, I want you to circle that phrase, so he departed. And then I want you to go backwards in your Bible, and I want you to go to verse 15. I want you to circle the word go. And then I want you just to draw a line from one of those sections to the other. God told him to go. Three verses later, we see he departs and he goes. The Lord said to go and Elijah departed. Remember, the Lord's plan. He's the boss. And this text, as we see, says that Elisha was actually plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. Now, this is just farming terminology. There are no tractors at this time, obviously, so the land would be tilled and plowed by taking two oxen and having this thing that drapes over them that holds them together, and then the farmer would walk behind them as they would till and plow the land. Okay? It's kind of how this would work. And Elisha has 12 yoke of oxen, which means he has 24 of them. Okay? Which kind of maybe seems to tell us that he is well off. His family is well off. Okay? It's quite a bit. And we see that Elijah, Elijah passes by Elisha and he casts his cloak upon him. Now, if that happened now, we, that would freak us out. We'd run away if someone just came by and was like, whoosh, whoosh. you know, it sounds like something Caleb would do with his weird girlfriend from when he's little, right? And it's just weird. It'd freak us out, right? It'd freak us out. But actually here it was pretty normal. All that that means is that um, uh, this is a way that Elijah basically enlists Elisha as his successor. You're going to be the one that comes after me. The power that the Lord is using to work through me is going to be passed on to you. Come and assist me in the meantime. That's kind of what's going on here. And Elisha's response to the call is really fun to read. Okay, so let's go back and reread verse 20 and add in there 21. It says this, he left, circle that, he left. Tie it to, um, so he departed and to go. Elisha left. He left the oxen and he ran after Elijah and said, let me kiss my father and mother and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people, and they ate. And then underliner circled this phrase. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. Four times people are moving here. They're going. They're answering the call. They are being obedient. They're being obedient. Now, we, some people say, oh, he went back to kiss his family. Is that really a thing? Actually, the, the way this text has it is it kind of is showing that his allegiance is going to be to Elijah and to the Lord. Because if you remember previously, the Lord's reminding Elijah that there are actually a group of people that have not fallen to kiss the feet of Baal, showing their allegiance to him. So that's, that's kind of juxtaposing what happens with Elisha, who goes and kisses his family, not to show allegiance to them, but to basically tell them goodbye. My allegiance is here. And in fact, it's, it's like reinforced by the fact that then he sacrifices all these oxen. Costs a lot of money. And he's going to, he's going to sacrifice it, and then he's going to leave. He's going to leave. Elijah obeys the Lord but not perfectly, and Elisha obeys the Lord, but not perfectly. Nonetheless, these two prophets, Elijah and Elisha, they indicate the way that the Lord's going to continue his plan, okay? Elijah obeys the Lord, and, um, and Elisha obeys the Lord, but not perfectly. Specifically with Elijah, here's something that happens. The Lord had told him when he was in the cave that he was to anoint Elisha. We never read about that happening. 
He also told him that he was to appoint these two other kings and anoint them. We never hear about that happening from Elijah. In fact, King Jehu, we know Elisha, because of further text that you can read in the future, um, and yeah, not right now, but in the future, you can read, is that Elisha actually is the one that sets up Jehu being anointed. So Elijah follows, but not perfectly. He, right? He's powerful. He slaughters all these, all these prophets of Baal, and then he goes and hides in a cave. He follows, but it's imperfect. And the reason I want you to understand that and to know that is because I need you to know that actually Elijah is not the hero of the story. And Elisha is not the hero of the story. And if you link your story to the Lord's, you are not the hero of the story. God is always the hero. Always. No one's going to thwart his plans. No one is going to end his story. So here's what I'm saying. Elijah obeyed. God said, go, and Elijah stepped out of the cave, and he went. Here's what you can do. Here's the choice you can make tonight. You can come alongside what God is already doing and join your stories to his, or you can step aside and let God do his thing because you're not going to thwart his plans. You're not. His story does not hinge upon you. I mean, think about it. Think about it. Why would it hinge upon us? We are imperfect. He is perfect. We are selfish. We are sinful. He is holy. We are struggling. We are completely lost in and of ourselves. And yet, in his goodness and joy, God reaches down to us and he invites us to join in what he is doing. God has historically created people, called people, and used people to accomplish his purposes and further his kingdom. Historically, that is the way God has moved and worked in this world. It is a privilege for us to be a part of his story. I mean, think about this. He called Moses, right? The stutterer, to lead his entire nation of people. He calls Elijah who's hiding in a cave with his tail between his legs, to go to Elisha and continue the story. He calls Paul, who is a murderer of Christians, to become a church planter. He calls Peter, a loudmouth, to be the leader of his church. He calls Timothy, the youngin, to set an example for older believers. He called my cousins, Jay and Caitlin Greer, the Americans, to to go to unreached people groups in Japan to reach them for the Lord. He called Eric Epperson and M.D. Neely to make videos to gather more support for foster family. He calls my friend Ashley to care for her high school small group. He calls my friend Micah, who's 15, to reach out to her other friend who is clearly starting to step away from the Lord and encourage her to join back into what the Lord is doing. He has called my mom to see her workplace as a mission field. And so she prays for her employees, and she brings the Lord up as often as she can in conversation. He calls Nate and Caleb to lead this week of CIY so that students can be challenged and encouraged and renewed. He calls a single woman in Oklahoma to take home an 11-year-old boy from a shelter. When Quan first came home with me at 11... I uh, wrote a poem for him. I know, weird. But here's, here's why I did it. I want you to know. One, I love doing stuff like that because I just do. And two, um, we were going to a counselor, and the counselor was talking about how he needed to be able to process his emotions better, and so she needed him to be able to name what he was feeling. And Quan was very much controlled by whatever he was feeling in the moment. So if he was angry, he was all the way angry, and he was going to act out of that. If he was sad, he was all the way sad, he was going to act out of that. Um, scared, act all, happy, didn't matter. And so I wrote this poem to help him understand how I can see this as a good thing and how he can improve it. And then the last half of the poem is a prayer of how I think God's going to use him. And I would read this to him every night before bed. And I brought it with me. Is it okay if I share it with you? Are you sure? Okay, I'm going to share this with you. Um, so, I've, I've not shared it with a group of people. I've, it's usually just something I read to Quan. So, here we go. He knows it. But it's called The Boy with the Big Heart. Fifth grader. 
That's how old he was. The boy with the big heart, he came in my life. He wriggled himself right in. And what happened to my heart, you wouldn't believe it. It grew in its size by 10. His heart was so big that when he felt happy, he smiled with every part. His eyes would sparkle, his legs would get jumpy. He just smiled right down to his heart. He can't hold in excitement. He squeals and he laughs and he yells. He hugs and gets goofy in a little sort of way. And to every person he tells why he is so excited and happy and ready, he says the whole bit with a grin, until you get all swept away, up, swept away in excitement. His happy just sucks you right in. His heart was so big that when he felt angry, he felt it right down to his bone. His eyes quickly narrowed, his voice, how it carried. The hurt he is feeling is shown. And after his anger, his heart was so big that he desperately wanted to mend. His eyes filled with tears, his heart filled with worry, until once again, we were friends. His heart was so big that when he felt sad, tear-filled eyes were the norm. He would try not to cry, may not even speak, but the tears were evidence of a storm. Brewing inside his thoughts, in his mind, and his soul, and his heart, He would cry for others and he would cry for himself. He would cry and cry out for a fresh start. And then he would sleep. When finally the tears would stop streaming, he would close his eyes and steady his breathing. He would escape reality and instead just try dreaming. And when he would wake, quiet, thoughtful, accepting, he would decide, enough being sad. Now it's time for correcting. For making things better, making things new, it's time for his fresh start. This is what the boy would decide to do, the boy with the big giant heart. He would look up, he would open eyes wide, he would lean into God and what God would provide. He would keep on moving and growing and loving, that's what the boy would decide. And you know what I saw from this big hearted boy? Something I knew would be done. I saw God use him to change the world, grabbing other hearts one by one. He's changed coaches and parents, and friends, and teachers. He's changed counselors, and principals, and small groups, and preachers. He's changed me. Actually, God has changed me through him. And I am so thankful. I could never express all my thanks to him. So arms open wide for my big hearted boy is how I try to remain. In happy times and sad, through good times and bad, the big hearted boy is who I claim. He has stolen my heart. He is my big-hearted boy. He has burrowed himself right in. And do you know what has happened to my heart? It has grown in its size by 10. That's it. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) That's it. And I would would read it to him because I I wanted him to know that if he would just allow God to work through him and in him, God has a plan for his life, and it is a good one, because God is good. God reaches down to us and invites us into what he is doing. He has historically created people, called people, and uses people to accomplish his purposes and further his kingdom. Man, I hope that you respond to that call and join him in his story. In Matthew 9, 35 through 38, Jesus says to his disciples, do you see all these people? The harvest is plentiful, but the workers, they are few. Pray and ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the mission field. He says in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, hey, you guys, you followers of me, go. And as you are going, make disciples, baptize them in my name, teach them to observe my ways, and I'll be with you. I'll be with you till the very end. He says in James 1.27 that we ought to take care of the orphans and widows. He says in Ephesians 2 that you were created for good works that he already prepared for you to do, that you should walk in them. He says in 2 Corinthians 5.16-20 that we are to regard no one according to the flesh if we are in Christ that he has given us a specific ministry of reconciliation, that we are ambassadors for Christ, that God himself is making his appeal to a lost world through us, 
through us. God reaches down to us and he invites us into what he is doing. I hope that you hear that tonight. He has historically created people, called people, and uses people to respond to his call to join him in furthering his kingdom, to join him in his mission. And here's the deal. Here's the deal. I think for a lot of us, when God first gets a hold of us, we can be on fire for him. And we can be all about his story, his purpose, his kingdom. And then for some reason, over time, it just kind of fizzles out. I don't know if it's just like we get, it, it just gets hard. Um, if, we, if we run into something and it makes us kind of hesitate because we get nervous. Or if we just kind of find ourselves not really thinking about it at all. But I can promise you that following Jesus is worth it. That sticking with him and his plan is worth it. It is not easy, but it is worth it. I'm going to say that again. If you're taking notes, write that down. It is not easy, but it is worth it. Because when you go home, something is going to happen that is going to cause you to get nervous about sticking with Jesus, reaching out to others for his sake. It is not easy, but it is worth it. Remember, you're joining his story. It's not the other way around. You are not the boss. He called Moses to lead his nation, right? And you guys know what that meant for Moses, right? He actually died before he ever went to the promised land. God's plan. A good God's plan, by the way. He calls Elijah, hiding in his cave, to do all these crazy good works and then to pass the torch to Elisha. He called Paul, right, to be this church planner. You know how Paul's life ended? He was beheaded. God's plan. He called Peter, right? Foundation for the church. You know what happened to Peter? He was crucified upside down. He called my cousins Jane, and Caitlin. These unreached people groups of Japan, and it might sound like this dreamy idea, but you know what that meant? That meant that they left everything they know, everyone, even their language, and went to a place where they knew they were going to feel alone some of the time. And God, in his goodness, he has given them a church family there. But it's not easy. It's not just this romantic idea that ends with a rolling of credits that makes us all feel warm and fuzzy inside. It is hard. It is day to day. It is day to day. He called me to take home that 11-year-old boy from the shelter. And you know what is going on now, six and a half years later with my son? We've had a lot of ups and downs. It's not easy. He was way behind in school. We had to get him all caught up in school. He was put in all these different classes and just fighting and a lot of things that we had to go through. And then he'd fall back behind. And if you were here last year um, at one of the Tennessee moves, you would have known my son at that point was like missing. He had run away from home. Um, he had run away, had found his biological mom and gotten into a lot of trouble. And so we've been dealing with these issues with the law for the last couple of years now. He was able to come home at a certain point and, um, you know, broken, going through that same poem, even as an older, an older teenage boy. And whenever he came home, he actually, we, we had to have an adoption happen. After six years of him being in my home fostered, he was adopted in September. That was a high moment for us. Uh, very high moment. I feel like I, I keep wanting to change the screensaver on my phone. I just can't take that one off. I can't do it. I just can't do it. And now, nine months after his adoption, um, he was actually arrested last week. going back and forth with the legal stuff, had him having to work these programs, and he just, he's a runner, and he just, he ran. And um, he was with some other teenage boys, and they did, made some very poor, stupid, ignorant choices. And Quan turned 18 in March, so he's going to be charged as an adult for the choices he made. And it is hard. 
And even preparing for this message, it was hard. And my dad was at a CIY last week and he came home and he talked about the caves. And he said that one of the things he asked you to stand up is to stand up if you're feeling hopeless. And I just started crying. That's sometimes how I feel. And I have to remember, it's not my story. It's not about me. It's not about Quan. It's God's story. And because it's God's story, I know I can trust him because God is good. And so I know I can have hope and I can step out and I can come to Tennessee and I can just share what's going on. So that hopefully you can see that it's worth it to stick with him. No matter the cost. No matter the cost. And the same woman that that, uh, God called to bring home that child, God is calling me now to take phone calls of my son. (laughs) And as hard as it is, God has been kind enough to me to give me opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to reach Quan for Jesus. The newest opportunity just happens to be through extremely expensive 15-minute phone calls. But I have his attention. He calls several times a day. And I can't think of anything else I'd want to talk to him about than the love that God has for him and the desire that God has for him to turn his life to be a follower of Jesus. Hear me tonight. God is calling you to reach others. There are some things that I think is hard to say that you got to be careful when you're speaking on the Lord's behalf, right? Like, that's a big deal. But I have not, I can't find anything in this book that would say otherwise. If you are a follower of Jesus, then God is calling you to reach others. And he does not promise that it will be easy. He actually kind of tells us that it's going to be the opposite of that. He does not promise that it won't cost you or that it'll be like an American dream come true. He does not even promise that you get to see how the plan ends, what the end result is. But you know what he does promise? He promises that he is with you. He promises that he will sustain you. He promises that he is here. He promises that the most privileged, alive, and purposeful life you can live is one that is faithful to Jesus and his mission. And his promises ring true. You will find your purpose when you reach others for the glory of God of God. So I guess the real question is this. Will you allow him to work through you? Will you truly attach your story to his and go wherever he calls you? And maybe if that's an easy answer for you, maybe it's like, yes, I yes, I want to do that. Then let me ask you one more question. Who? Who will you reach? Who will you reach with the good news of Jesus Christ? 